All right, here we go. All right, welcome everybody. This is Waiting Room Podcast. I am Kyle Waite. Uh, today, I wanted to go over a little bit about uh, a little over sports, a little over news, a little over uh, a little over some personal stories. Um, I want to lead off Aaron Rodgers. Um, for anybody that likes football, watch football, cares about football, um, we all know. Hey, he uh, was about to be traded, or was potentially about to be traded. Uh, nothing came to fruition, or it hasn't yet. However, uh, you know, we all pick sides in any kind of, you know, conversation, argument, whatever. Uh, I find it hard to side with the team. I find it incredibly hard. I don't know how 2019-2020 they go to the NFC Championship game, lose by 17 to the Niners, who lose to the Chiefs. Uh, they do nothing. They do nothing in the offseason. They actually subtract some stuff from their team. Fortunately, go 13-3 again end up in the NFC Championship game again where they lose to Tom Brady, which, you know, there's no shame losing Tom Brady. Uh, you know, For all intents and purposes, he's the greatest quarterback that's ever played the game. You don't have to like him, but statistically, it's probably true. Uh, but again, you have know, 17-point loss, 5-point loss, doing nothing. Um, I don't know. I don't personally love the Packers. Kind of a boring team to me. Uh, but I do love Aaron Rodgers. He's from Northern California. I'm from Northern California. Uh, I find it fascinating anytime, not just sports, with anything. You make it out of your hometown, you do something cool. He just happened to be doing something cool where he's on national television week to week. Uh, so probably a little bit of bias. But again, you know, you go from February where the season ends. He says, you know what? I want to be here. Two days before the NFL draft, he says, I no longer want to be here. Again, just me personally, I don't, I don't, I can't, can't fathom that Aaron Rodgers, who's, a, he's a different guy, he doesn't speak to his family uh, for personal reasons. I, it's not my business, it's not, you know, again, he's on national television, you know, during the football season, but he doesn't speak to his family for whatever reason. Uh, he's, just, he's a different guy. And I'm going to be honest, a lot of people from Northern California, just, they're, they're different. And I don't mean... I don't mean Sacramento. Sacramento is not Northern California. You can count Sacramento as Northern California. But realistically, we're talking uh, probably Williams and up. Williams, California, and up. Little different breed of people. Uh, it's honestly, for people that didn't know, there is a part of California that is fairly conservative. Uh, I would say it sticks about Williams, California, and to the northern border of California. Uh, again, I just... It was bugging me a little bit today, especially seeing that, hey, you know, maybe he'll get traded. Maybe he won't. I don't know. But, hey, hope the best for him. Uh, the next thing, small thing on basketball I just want to touch on. Uh, again, most of my base doesn't care about New York. Neither do I. I despise most things New York. I despise most major markets, despite living in San Antonio, which is on the lower end of the major markets. But the New York Knicks are in the, the NBA playoffs for the first time in eight years. I think it's dope. I think it's cool when big historical teams are good. It's just, it's more fun. Obviously, I'm a Sacramento Kings fan. They're just never going to be good again is what I've, you know, what I've reserved, uh, what I've resigned to think. I just, I, I don't think they're ever going to be good again. But when those big market teams are good, it, it's fun for everyone, especially because it's been so fun to dog on the Knicks for ever. As long as I've been alive for the most for most of my lifetime, the Knicks have been trash. For most of it. Uh, sticking to New York sports, uh, I this is this is going to get a little touchy. Uh, eight members of the New York Yankees, including one of their top players, tested positive for COVID. Yeah, we've been going over the last year plus of people getting COVID and it being kind of a, a way of life. However all of them were vaccinated. Uh, say what you will, it's the Johnson and jo Johnson vaccine. Uh, I mean, it's got its own set of problems. It's not that it's funny, it's kind of sad. I mean, the Johnson Johnson vaccine is 70% effective, we all know that. But that coupled with blood clots, coupled with God knows what other problems, really, you know, makes, makes you wonder. Uh, 
Uh, I'm not saying don't get vaccinated. I think vaccination for various things are important. I'm just saying uh, I do find it funny in the small potatoes terms because I am a Boston Red Sox fan. From the time I was a little kid, love the Boston Red Sox. Yes, I did kind of root for the A's and the Giants just because, again, I lived in Northern California. However, when I was allowed to have a little bit more of a thought, uh, I'd, I'd constantly see the Red Sox play. So personally, I mean, I get to laugh a little bit. The Red Sox are in first place. Now the Yankees are dealing with COVID issues. Uh, with that, uh, my guest today has been sitting there quietly, patiently. Uh, I'd like him to introduce himself. Hi. Um, I am Ward Officer 1, Ben Kelly. And... All right, Ben. So I have to ask you, I know, uh, I know, but do you have any interest in this, in this story at all? Uh, really, honestly, the second that you start talking uh, MLB, uh, NFL, anything, the, the, the three... The big three-letter organizations, man, I, I tune out a bit. <laughs> oh, big three? So, I mean, is that any three-letter organization, Ben, Pretty, or is that just is that just sports? It's 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 mostly sports. I'm not going to lie. When stuff, like, are you talking about, like, FBI, CIA? Hey, see, he knew where I was going with this. If I, if I hear something like that, that'll catch my interest. But, I mean, even if I was super into sports, like, I'm just so busy right now. Like, I barely have time to talk to people. Like this is this is great to be completely honest. Yeah, I, I agree. So so sports or not, uh, do you have any feelings on people being vaccinated and still contracting the virus? It's concerning. <laughs> like what? Why? Um, so we're supposed to be getting a vaccine that's supposed to help prevent the spread of this virus and a lot of people are taking it as like this cure-all. It's supposed to be a cure-all, right? Right. But um, if you take the medicine and then you still get sick, concerning, I guess, is just the word that I'll stay on. Right. I, I mean, and I, I would I would in general agree with that. It's a, it's a little concerning. On top of this is the same vaccine that, you know, people started getting blood clots with. Yeah. That doesn't help. No, and I, and I get it. it. It's one of those things. I am sure that everybody watching know knows that I am also in the United States Air Force. I'm a staff sergeant. Uh, I have opted not to because this is maybe the first time in history that the military has given you the option to do something or not. So I opted to not get vaccinated yet. It doesn't mean I never will. It doesn't mean I'll fight it when it happens. Uh, you know, I personally would like to see a little bit more time and research. I, I've heard that they've been doing studies on stuff like this for a year. However, the concerning part for me then comes in, well, if we've been doing this for years, why do we seem so lost? Yeah, I guess it's all based on perception. Um, I'm I'm with you. I'm with you uh, for the most part on all that. Like I said, busy schedule. Um, flight school does not really provide me a lot of free time. Um, the Army and and Fort Rucker here in Alabama has given us the option, and I too have opted out. I I just don't. When when am I going to have time to go and? run into Publix or something like that to sit down and receive this vaccination. And on top of it, it grounds you apparently like you're not even able to apply for uh, due to certain regulations uh, in the army. Actually think in the air force too. I think we share regulations when it comes to this, but yeah, you're, you're like off flight set for 48 hours or 72 hours, something like that. But like if you're going to go get it, you have to get it on a Friday and so that you can fly on Monday, but we know you're still going to feel like crap, but screw you go get it if you want. I mean, I haven't gotten it. I'm, I don't plan on getting it. I'm probably not going to get it while I'm here in Alabama. And we'll probably once I PCS, but yeah. So, I mean, at the very least you're open to getting it when, you know, provided we have a little bit more information on it. Yeah. If more and more people start getting it. And honestly, 
if they told me tomorrow, hey, if you go get both shots and you get fully vaccinated and you don't have to wear the mask anymore, I'd go get it. <laughs> I'd schedule it so fast. I'd find the time all of a sudden, you know? You, well, hey, you just, you you, you found a, a perfect segue to, to my next topic. Yeah. Uh, I believe it was yesterday, our president, Joe Biden, came out and said something to the effect of, you can wear a mask or you can get vaccinated. You have the choice. Basically, basically saying that that's that's your choice. You get those two options. That's it. Now, my biggest thing, uh, I don't know if this was just directed at staff or not. However, um, I did find it interesting. I found it interesting that provided we've had a president who tweeted all sorts of things. But... <laughs> to come out and say your choices are this, it, it did get me. It did get me curious because a lot of people responded sort of negatively to it. A lot of people were like, "Oh, so, you know," they compare it to previous dictators, tyrants, what have you. It just I found it interesting that the people's choice, because again, he he won the popular vote, he won the electoral college, he he did everything he's supposed to as a president. But I find it curious that the guy who's so for the people is basically giving you an ultimatum. Uh, again, I'm not saying that our, our last president, we can say whatever we want about that guy. Uh, now he's not currently our president. Yeah. I will tell those uh, who are actually watching myself and Ben are limited on what we can say about the man himself. However, um, we will share our feelings on certain topics provided, you know, it doesn't, you know, get us in trouble. Yeah. So, so it, it makes, you know, where do you sit with it? Do you think he's saying everybody this, or is it just the Senate and White House staff that just opened with that new reg? Oh, God. Uh, from what I've read, my perception is that he was speaking for everyone. I don't think he was really focusing in on a specific group of people. I think he was my perception from what I've seen is that he was speaking generally for our country. Um, which, yeah, I guess it does kind of come off a little irony, <laughs> lack of a better term. But I don't know. I, I, I definitely think that he was referring to everyone. Uh, is that is that what's happening? Is he like trying to back? Is he backpedaling a little bit on what he's so, saying? Uh, again, I it was it was something I caught up in, being that it kind of tied to the subjects we were talking about. I figured I'd, I'd you know, throw it into the conversation today, especially because again, we are people that are pretty involved with more often than not not getting choices for things, yeah. but also again, this this is the the choice we're currently. We're currently given, hey, we can either wear a mask or we can get vaccinated. Um, right now, we're being told, uh, you know, you don't have to get vaccinated, which, again, I think it's the coolest thing in the world. I know some people feel uh, weird about it, but I've been in the military for 14 years. This is the first time that the military has said, you get the choice to do this. Like, no, no current repercussions, but it's the first time in 14 years the military has been like, if you want to do it, you can. Yeah. I don't know. So I, I will say, um, I more than like, I don't know, CNN or Fox or any other regular civ civilian, I guess, uh, like broadcasting companies, like news networks. I, I'm not, I haven't watched TV in so long. Unfortunately, I'm one of those people that gets all my news from Facebook, which sucks. But um, I hate saying that. I sound like... Hey, hey you got to do what you got to do. What a millennial, right? Um, but I I do follow a couple of pages. Um, one of my favorite ones is actually Terminal CWO and Terminal Chief Warrant Officer. And they do a really good job. They're kind of what Army uh, WTF moments used to be, kind of. Um, they do a good job of like slamming and just, you know, painting up the people, like putting on blast of like the generals, the commanding generals at different posts who are basically doing illegal stuff. That's been kind of, uh, rolling through my head a lot and kind of in conversations between service members, um, down here at my state. But like, yeah, we have a choice 
but do we really? Because there's definitely some uh, some higher up officials who are basically getting blasted for blackmailing. Um, well, that, that's I don't, I don't want to dabble into this too deep, you know, because you don't want to slant anybody or anything like that. But that's definitely things that are making the rounds. It's just hearing about the bad the bad stuff like that. Like, hey, if you don't go get this vaccine, uh, you can't take leave. If you don't take this vaccine, you're going to go live in a tent with no air conditioning uh, while you're at JRTC, while everybody else who's gotten the vaccine gets to stay in the air conditioning out in the desert. Stuff like that, you know. Um, luckily, nothing like that has happened here. We were uh, we were actually told earlier today um, that we have general orders that keep coming out on like a monthly or bi-monthly basis from the commanding general down here is General Francis. And uh, he's... He's very pro mask and as as he should be, I guess. We're gonna continue wearing masks no matter what the president says. It really comes down to command discretion. But it is cool that we have a choice. Um, almost in a spiteful way. I I just I also have just not decided to go get it. I know that there's a lot of people out there that are like, you need to. Like my my family, a lot of my family is uh very right. liberal, left leaning. I find myself to be sort of a centrist which is basically like being a republican to <laughs> my family and uh just if you if you don't go and get it you're like some kind of a monster and i don't know i i appreciate the choice and i think even from a spiteful standpoint i'm just i'm not into it like you can block me if you can throw me in leavenworth i i'm not going to get it right now you know it, it it's it's right well, and, that, and so that's that's the, the the really big thing is you know we all have family members uh we we've all probably got an elder family member who who may or may not be at risk and if those people feel the the necessity to get it i'm all for it i don't i don't have an issue with people getting the vaccine yeah. because they feel comfortable with it yeah. I, just, I do think it's silly that we're at a point where it's uh, you get two choices. You get you get to wear the mask or you get the vaccine. And if that's truly what the president's saying, it's it's a little it's a little shameful just because it seems like they're trying to push a vaccine, which, as I say, one of them has some fairly glaring issues, is what I'd say. I wouldn't I wouldn't say it's the worst thing in the world. Seventy percent effective, though. I mean, I know we were speaking offline. I said, hey. You get the cold, you, maybe you get the cold, the flu shot every year. Uh, half the people still didn't get the flu. Uh, yeah, that's what happens. Um, but again, I just, it's one of those things. The flu vaccine's been around for a long time. COVID vaccine, less than a year. I mean, hey, I've heard s some cool stories. Hey, maybe you'll get superpowers. That'd be, if you guarantee I get superpowers, I'd be in line tomorrow. Yep. Um, but, you know, I'm saying well, this is a joke, but at, again, if you if you want to get the vaccine, get, get vaccinated. I think vaccinating for most things. I mean, that's why a lot of we have a lot of dead diseases is because people vaccinate. However, I, I don't think we should be at a place where we're pushing. You, you have to. You have to. You're a bad person if you don't get it. I think that's if you have to guilt people into doing something, mm -hmm. I think you're doing it wrong. Most definitely. I, I wholeheartedly agree. Um, I saw a meme the other day. It was like a bunch like a bunch of faces talking to one face, and all the faces were like, are you telling me that your freedom is more important than my safety? And the one face is like, yeah, I don't know you. Like, <laughs> but, but I mean, that's, that's the thing, is, is we do a lot of, it's not just COVID, so for anybody that's actually watching this, hey, I, I don't, we're at a place where we have to guilt people to do the right thing. And it's, it's sometimes it is the right thing. Sometimes it is. I just think a vaccine that's so young isn't something we shouldn't push on people. Don't have an issue with you getting it. I just I don't think we should be pushing people to get it. Uh, I yeah. think we've, I think we've beaten the dead horse enough. Uh, <laughs> really what I want to is, is I want to bring you on. Um, for people that didn't catch it earlier, Ben is currently in flight school. Uh, I wanted to bring him on because I find his story 
interesting from the perspective, whether or not you're not in the military, uh, I do find it interesting from the perspective that you can go and do more if you actually put the effort in. And Ben and I have a relationship. Ben, I mean, you know, God willing, will be my future brother-in-law. <laughs> uh, but, you know, he's he's currently married to the sister of my girlfriend. Um, he's a great dude, and he had a great story, and I wanted you all to hear it. So, uh, Ben, I want to start. When when did you join, when did you join the army? Right. Um, so I joined the army in 2015. Um, I come from a big military family. Uh, I got a brother who was in the Navy or I can't remember if he's in the reserves of the Navy or not. He did six years in the Navy. And then I have another brother who did five years in the Marines as a firefighter. And uh, my dad is or was a lieutenant colonel. He's a pediatric nephrologist. He was also in the Army. And then my mom's father was a Vietnam veteran. He was a POW. He flew F-105 uh, F Thunderbirds, I think. Okay. Uh, Thunder Chief, F-105 Thunder Chiefs. And uh, he was actually shot down during the Vietnam War and was a POW for uh, six or seven years. He was he was there for, he, he made his way through the zoo, um, hotel. Wow. Boy, all of those uh, pretty, pretty frequently for a long time, and um, was eventually sent home, which was really awesome. I think my mom was roughly nine years old, and then uh, she didn't see her dad again until she was over that. I think it's like four, fourteen or fifteen years old, something along those lines. So just big military background. Um, another kind of interesting thing, though, fast is that this is my adoptive family. Uh, they adopted me at 16. Uh, their son, their youngest son and I were on the wrestling team together in high school. And he was just a friend. And his house was just one of the ones that we would go over to all the time. And now today he's my brother and the mom who would like give us snacks. Now my mom. So being indoctrinated into a family like that, um, I just, I didn't. Biologically speaking, I just they come from that great of a background. So all I wanted to do was just emulate, emulate, emulate. So I really just hit a point where my life wasn't really going the way that I wanted it to. Um, I'd made a couple of off decisions, I guess you could say, in my later teen years, uh, despite the influence, uh, moving out on my own and trying to make it on my own. Like, oh, I don't need my parents and stuff like that. You always need your parents. <laughs> They're all hey, hey, we're 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 in agreement there. You you do always need your parents. Yeah. Um don't want to get you in trouble. Do you I mean what were you doing those first first you know fifteen years before before you you know fell into that situation where you got adopted? So um I grew up on the west side of San Antonio in Tex San Antonio, Texas, and um I am deceptively uh, Hispanic. I am mixed. Uh, my biological dad is Irish, and then my biological mom is Mexican, of Mexican descent. And I am biologically the oldest of six boys, and not conducive. Like when you're a cab driver, my biological dad was a cab driver. He was just always in a when he wasn't working as a cab driver, he was a delivery guy for like an auto parts store or something. He was just always driving. That was his thing. Never really making that much money. Um, not not going to make it too weird, not get too deep into it, but not, also just not the best household. Um, just mm, some like just abuse and stuff, like not to make it weird once again, but it's, it's, it's real, you know, so just stuff like that it, it went on for several years until finally i was 16 and i was just i'd had enough so i took off basically so there's not there's not really not not much to tell um the first 15 years of my life were just a precursor that you know this is what not to do this is the manual for how not to live your life um, right. yeah so yeah just six boys shoved into three bunk beds that were built inside of a 10 by 10 room in like a crappy duplex with roaches and rats everywhere. 
and food stamps like and WIC and just welfare like no other. Just I just didn't didn't want to be there, didn't want to be that. And uh, eventually it just reached the head and I couldn't take the treatment anymore. Um, I found out later that it was always the oldest because after I left my, the second oldest brother, uh, he began to take the brunt of the abuse and stuff like that. Right. So it it sucks, but at 16, I wasn't really out, you know, oh, it's going to fall to that guy when I'm out of here. But packed packed all my stuff up. I lived for a while out of uh out of four different bags, like two duffel bags kind of, and then my school backpack, then another separate backpack. I just walked around like that. Uh slept on playground, like inside playground stuff. Um I was showering. Like like I said, I was on the wrestling team in high school, access to the locker room and stuff. That's where I would shower and do right. hygiene. That that's pretty much what was going on. And eventually uh it wasn't even the youngest brother of of the family that I'm uh of my family now, of my adoptive family, it was the older brother who I didn't really talk to that much. He approached me one day at lunch and was like, randomly, like, hey, what's going on? And for some reason, I just felt safe enough and just comfortable enough to just let loose. And I, I pretty much poured my heart out to this kid. And he brought me home. He was like, hey, both my parents are pediatricians. I think we can find a way to help you. Come, Come stay with us. Um, I obviously know you, we all know you, like, you're not a bad kid. You're not a bad guy. So I got on the school bus and went to the, uh, the neighborhood that all the, all of my friends lived in. They all lived in the same neighborhood. I was the only one that lived like in the, in the little ghetto area down, down at the end of the street. Right. And they, uh, yeah, I, I spent the night for a couple of nights and they were just like all in child protective, protective services and stuff like that. Just trying to find me help. Um, but in the state of Texas, man, if you're under the age of 18 and you're a boy, um, between the ages of like 11 and 18, I think just a black hole of crap. And after a couple of nights of, of just going to school and that was where I would go, I would go there after school and I would live my life and hang out with my friends. And then I started having dinner with the family and then they started trying to get me to a driver's license and then, uh, trying to, um, I, I made a conscious decision to drop out early. I did not, I, I wasn't thinking at the time. I didn't have them to influence me quite yet. So they actually helped me to go get my GED. And all of these things just started culminating until I became practically, I mean, their last name is Rosen. So I, I practically became Ben Rosen. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's, and then I, and then after I realized that they were, they were basically a reflection of what I wanted to be. So I started trying to emulate my dad and wanted to go into, you know, the medical field probably. And yeah, I, that was, that was the first 15 years. I, I, I just did that thing where you say, Hey, so long story short, and then you just go and talk. Hey, I mean, and that's, again, that's, that's what, that's, that's the environment I want here. Uh, honestly, I, I want to bring, I want to bring people on and I mean, we all have time constraints for stuff, but realistically, I, I you know, I want to know. I want people to hear this because realistically, a lot of a lot of people don't understand that some of their situations are more common. Some people have a nice, easy upbringing, uh, but I've met more often than not. I've met a lot of people that had issues and, and thought that you know they they didn't they didn't have something with that shared experience, and especially at that age, you don't get typically you don't get kids reaching out like like that you don't get kids that are that like well, honestly want to know what's going on with you like are are you okay it's yeah. it's a it's not a normal thing so when we all become adults i found it's easier to sit there and talk to people and be like oh you you had some stuff happen me too me me too like yeah. you're not alone and you know some people get to this age where where they don't they, they haven't realized yet that there there's a lot of a lot of people that that shared experience uh, so like i said man don't ain't never got to apologize for for, for sharing because <laughs> that's what i want i i want i want to know what's what's going on with you what happened with you what led to this you know decision because you're in flight school now what did you do when you first joined the army yeah so like i said a uh, big big influence just big military influence behind me 
And then a uh, very big medical influence. So uh, it's funny enough, funny enough, my brother, uh, the younger one, uh, Josh, uh, he was the one who was a Marine for five years. So of course he had to have his EMTB certification. He's now in nursing school. He's applied as an RN um, later this year. My mom has been an RN and like a, a social worker of some kind for decades. Um, like I said, my dad is a pediatric nephrologist. I mean, uh, along with that, he's also a prior pilot. He got his private pilot's license um, earlier in life at some point. So, and then of course my dad, like like I said, my mom's dad was a uh, Vietnam pilot. So just a big medical and aviation background just behind me, pushing me. Um, so when I went and talked to my recruiter back in 2015, about what potential jobs I'd be, you know, I took the ASVAB that scored high and I could do anything. And for some reason, they just really wanted to give me infantry, cab scout, tanker. I feel like they were just trying to take the kid with the GED and just shove him into like whatever slot they had. I mean, if, uh, I, was a, if I was a recruiter, I'd probably do, hey, he's got a GED. Like yeah. ASVAB score says this, nah, he's got a GED. He's infantry, infantry material all the way. Yeah. And honestly, they, I don't, Personally, honestly speaking, looking at myself, I think I could have actually done pretty well. Um, I'm a very physical guy. I was not in high school. I, I wish I was a better wrestler. Um, I wish I was faster. I wish I was stronger back then. If I was then what I am now, I don't know if I'd have such, I would have had such a hard time. Uh, but I, I think I would have done. And also, you know, being, you know, 5'5", five, five, the Napoleon complex would have come up and it definitely but it helped me to like try to drive a little farther. Oh, well, you know, hey, you know, you know what? I mean, <laughs> you don't you don't act five five. That's you know that counts for somebody. Thanks. That's the Napoleon. <laughs> but come on, let's. I mean, you got you got to say it out loud. You, you know, I know what you did. The viewers yeah. don't know what you, what you joined the army to do. <sighs> All right, I I joined the army, and. I joined the army as a dental assistant, uh, nomenclature, 68 dental specialist. I was actually set to be an MP. I was going to be military police, 31 Bravo. And, uh, when I got, when I got to MEPS, I was all ready to go to OSIT, Fort Leverett. What is it? Leverett? Lost in the woods. Yeah. Uh, out in Missouri. And I was going to do one station unit training and just go to basic and AIT all in one and come out a military police officer. And I was really all for it. And uh, when I got to MEPS, they brought, they found out that I had a federal debt because I, I tried to go to UTSA in San Antonio. And I went for like one semester and then was like, nope, not for me. But I still spent all the money on like booze uh, <laughs> and just stupid crap. So... Uh, I, I had all this federal debt at the time and they were like, Hey, we can't give you a security clearance right now. We got some options for you. We're going to send you in today. We're going to give you an MOS, but you got to pick something from this list. And it was like tanker, uh, tanker infantry. And I don't know, something else stupid that I didn't recognize. And I definitely didn't want, and I was like, you know, off chance, do you have anything in the 68 series, which is the medical MOSs? So right. they called up to somebody higher. They came back to me and they're like, we have one thing. And I was like, I wanted to be a 68 whiskey so bad. Like I wanted to be a, a combat medic. If I was going to do it, I wanted to be a medic. And they were like, we have 68 echo. Like, what the hell is that? And they're like, it's a dental assistant. So it's either that or infantry. And I started just crying, just burst into tears. It was like, I'll take it. <laughs> so I came, I went in there, a, a freaking potential police officer. And when I came out to the waiting room and saw my mom and my wife and my daughter, they were like, why are you crying? And I was like, I'm going to be a fucking dental assistant. And then just walked away sobbing and went and signed the paper. Tears in my eyes, all pissed off, swearing in. It was bad, man. I was, I, from the get go, I just knew it wasn't for me. From the second they said those words, I I knew it wasn't for me. But all of that being said, uh, like I like I like I have said, I'm I'm a pretty physical guy. I work out a lot. I'm always lifting, always running, always doing something. 
Well, when you're a really physical guy and you go into an MLS like that, it really does set you up well. Like if you if you have a 300 and you're like combat MOS, you know, pretty, I'd, I'd say that's a pretty common thing. I've heard otherwise, but I my perception is if you're in, if you're a combat MOS, you got to be a pretty fit dude, pretty strong, modern. and uh, being being like a 300 PT score in the dental world. That sets you up pretty good. So um, I ended up. So, so for for all for all of the the lay people, gosh. essentially, what is a three hundred PT score for the army? So the back uh, back in two thousand eighteen, when I was first taking them um, into two thousand sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, uh, this initial ACF or APFT Army Physical Fitness Test uh, to max it for my age bracket. I was 23 at the time. So to max it is a 13 minute, two mile. It was like 82 sit-ups, I think, and 75 push-ups, I think, all in two minutes. Right. Yeah. So that is that. That is a perfect score for that age bracket. And yeah, it, it really does a good job of setting you apart. Physical fitness will get you a long way in the military, generally speaking, but when, like I said, when your MOS is a dental assistant, there's not a lot of competition to stack up to, right? Which helps. And then you, then you but every every station seemed to have uh, two or three of like really just fit people, and they're the ones who would typically go and compete at boards. So as a PFC, I actually ended up winning uh, the Soldier of the Year at Fort Hood, and. Um, it's it's just a big best warrior competition, you know. There's a it's about a week long. You have a PT test, you have a an, an essay, you have oral board with you go in your dress blues in front of like a bunch of high ranking people, and they throw questions about army regulations and stuff at you. Mystery swimming events. I mean, it's just this huge. Event. Uh, it is very physically and mentally taxing. So as an E3, a PFC army for a little over a year. I won my first uh, Soldier of the Year board. So that kind of set the tone for me at Fort Hood, uh, which was my first duty station. And I really just kept going to the boards. I think I've been to 18 or 19 boards at this point in my career. And as an enlisted person, if you, you, know, you, you win those boards, you basically kind of become the golden child of your unit. That became my job. Like I, I was crying in MEPS that day before basic training. I don't want to be this. I don't want to be this. I don't want to do this job. And then when I got to my unit, after I started winning all the boards, I sort of kind of didn't have to. It, it, it really kind of worked out. They were like, no, you need to go up to headquarters and you need to study because you're our representative at the Soldier of the Region Board in, in a couple of months. And it's like all the states like Texas, Louisiana, uh, California, North Carolina, or, uh, New Mexico, like everything in the central, like Midwestern area. Everybody comes together from all the duty stations, all the top people from each station, and they compete and try to beat each other. Right. So, yeah. So that one, I, I ended up winning. Uh, I got runner up. I lost by one point. Still kills me today. Um, so I was the runner up soldier of the region. But all of these things really culminated. Um, I didn't really know what I was doing at the time. I thought I was just going to be Command Sergeant Major Kelly one day. Uh, the dental field like i guess this is it i guess this is my life um but you know it, it really set me up and i didn't i didn't know it at the time but it set me up i didn't know i was making these bullet points unintentional bullet points for a packet that was going to come together later and i mean before that even happened i think this is the i'm going to segue because i i could talk about fort hood all day there's all sorts of stuff to talk about when it comes i to mean that. that's I feel like it's another podcast. We want you into Fort Hood <laughs> for those that are uh, at least a little abreast of the Fort Hood situation. It is not fantastic. We wish all of those people stationed at Fort Hood some good luck. Uh, you know, yeah, yeah. It's not. It's probably probably a subject for a, for another pod, whole other podcast. Although I will say, um, can't talk too much crap about Fort Hood because. Here in flight school, they give you a wish list. Uh, you can lay out um, all the available units. They give you a list, and you put them in order of precedence where you want to go. Guess what's number one on my list? 
I, I mean, I'm hoping somewhere cool like another country. No, it's Fortehead. Oh. <laughs> We want to come home. We want to come back to Texas. We I, did. I, hey, I, I hear you. I hear you. It's just, it's, you're, you're going to, you're going to find very few people putting Fort Hood, especially in the, the current climate. Yeah. You're going to find know. very few people with that at the top of their list, but. Definitely. Uh, all right. So, so dental assistant, I, from the, from the day I met you, finding out that you were, I, again, I wasn't sure if you were dental assistant, if you did just admin work, it just, <laughs> It struck me as very odd. So you went from dental assistant. Where where'd you go from from dental assistant? Because I know there's a there's a middle period. There's a middle period of, and I don't know if that was just you being the the professional board guy for your unit or what you were doing in between that time from dental assistant to now you are in flight school. Yeah. So it's definitely carry on top of what kind of pushed me into becoming uh, a warrant officer and going to flight school and stuff. So after Fort Hood, or I guess while I was at Fort Hood, I applied for a position because at the time, we didn't really know what we had. We, we didn't realize that seeing our family every single weekend in San Antonio is well within the Fort Hood footprint. You know, you don't got to drop leave to go. We didn't have to drop leave to go home. We could just stay at my parents' okay. house, have family. It was, it was awesome. We, we truly took it for granted. But all of that. Still wasn't enough to keep Specialist Kelly and his family uh, sitting there for too long. We were we, we we wanted a change, so I applied for a position with Special Operations, and I got it. It it really does help to have a perfect PT score and uh, perfect marksmanship and a bunch of you know soldier of the year of the year. Yeah, that'll, well, that's that'll put that'll do it. Yeah, and then uh, right before I went, actually, I went to something called Air Assault School, which a lot of people outside of the Army don't know. Air Force is the other branch that really knows what I'm about, if if at all. But I attended Air Assault School on Fort Hood, so that's another thing, too. A dental assistant who's got a set of wings on their chest makes no sense. But there I was. So all of these things culminated into me getting selected for a, a dental position within special operations. So um, we PCS to Fort Bragg, and I eventually became the NCO. I, I picked up E5 there. Um, I went to airborne school. Uh, they sent the dental guy to airborne school, so I was double stacked wings on a dental guy. You know what? Say say what you will about uh, not making sense. <laughs> at, the, at the very least, if the Army, what you're doing for me, is painting the picture at the very least. If you set yourself up right for the army, that you you may potentially be able to go anywhere, even if you're a dental assistant, which blows my mind. Yeah, but, I I was told I lost count of the amount of times that I got told that I would never go or attend any of these schools. You'll never go, and they, these were things I wanted to do too. Like, you'll never go to Sears School. You're not. Ne you'll never do that in your career. You'll never. Airborne air, air assault is down the street here on Fort Hood, and you're not gonna. Why would we send a dental assistant there? Right. I started knocking these things out, and I started succeeding, and it, it becomes a, a snowball effect. Um, another thing that I actually did not bring up. Uh, I've I've actually attended SFAS, which is uh, Special Forces Assessment and Selection. Uh, I reached a point in my dental career, uh, pretty much like three or four months after I got there. And I realized that I didn't want to suck spit out of someone's mouth for the rest of my life. You know what? Maybe I should try to go and be a Green Beret. I found out my MOS wasn't compatible with Ranger Regiment. Um, and there was no, at the time, there was nothing available for like airborne or going into the soft environment. The only thing you could do is just straight up change your MOS. So I actually trained for five to six months, training up on Fort Hood, uh, running around with Green Berets who were on post at the Green Beret Recruiting Center. And I, I got my body where it needed to be, and I attended special assessment selection back in 2016. Unfortunately, uh, I did go as a PSD, and I think maybe being like a really strong dental assistant kind of messed my mind a little bit because I actually got non-selected while I was there. I am a 19-day non-select out of SFAS. So physically and mentally, I was there. Career-wise and emotionally, Emotional maturity wise, I just don't think that they were looking for me at the moment. I made it 
And I, I, th I think people forget that. Um, I am in a also I am in a very basic bare bones career field with security forces. For those that don't know, security forces. It, to a point, I mean, yes, we're the guys standing at gates, uh, you know, checking your ID. We're we're the ones that, you know, I mean, we also respond to issues <laughs> on base. However, I mean the the idea painted for this career field is very, uh, you know, it's very low. But what I'll say is for those people that are trying to get into bigger career fields, you know, special tactics, uh, anything in the soft world, really, uh, emotional maturity is, is a huge thing. That's what I've learned. Uh, I've been to Iraq, Afghanistan, Kuwait, Qatar, uh, and I've somehow always ran it. I mean, Iraq and Afghanistan make sense. We're going to have, we're going to have soft guys there, but realistically you, you'd be shocked where you're just like oh like you aren't some some of the guys aren't the biggest the strongest whatever but they're big enough they're strong enough um and emotionally you know they can they can handle it because it's not a you know it's not a fun career field it's not you know i mean it can't be fun let's 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 take that let's let's roll that back it, it could definitely be fun yeah. i mean i've never seen a special tactics guy not love his job however um when we talk about emotional maturity uh, we, we still do have a, a big issue in the military community with what happens when you come home so i mean it's a bummer for you i, I definitely see that it's like hey like i i fit right and they're like yes yes and no but for those watching uh yeah again you can be big enough you can be fast enough you can be smart enough you can be all you check all the boxes but uh yeah. Emotional maturity is is one of those boxes that people never really think of, and, yeah. uh, and it, it counts. Yeah, they they definitely did not. They did a. I want to say my initial uh, statement is they did a really poor job of prepping me. No, that's not really that's that's a private Kelly answer. Uh, Warrant Officer One Kelly says you didn't know what you were getting yourself into because it was I was big I big I was big I was strong I was fast. But when we got to team week, that's really where I hit a wall. And I I found out that I'm not, at the time anyway, I wasn't like a big problem solver. And I, I blamed others for my shortcomings and stuff like that. And especially in a high stress environment, you don't know how you'll act until you get there. And you haven't eaten for three days and you've already walked, you know, 56 clicks with 50 pounds on your back and you're with eight other dudes trying to carry uh, a patient, a downed pilot, you know, another eight clicks through the woods on like a makeshift gurney made of 50 pound iron bars. You know, you don't, you don't know who you are until you're doing shit like that. And I found out that I wasn't that strong. <laughs> I thought I was stronger than I was. Um, but anyway, it still also served as like that experience definitely prepped me to come back to the dental unit and that might set me up to become Sergeant Kelly. Um, those experiences were super unique and, even failing, um, it provided me that experience that not a lot of people get. And it, it, it was good. It was a good experience. Um, and it was kind of a blessing that I didn't become that. Um, cause I, I just, I'm blown away at how satisfied I am with what I'm doing now. But anyway, so all of that happened at hood segue PCS to brag, um, went to airborne, became the NCYC basically for sort of for Sp first special forces command dental. Um, we served uh, 528 sustainment brigade, special airborne third special forces group, uh, psyops groups, civil affairs, like just the soft umbrella. I was the dental guy <laughs> for all intents and purposes. Right. So it was cool. I wasn't a green beret, but I worked on their teeth. <laughs> <laughs> so, hey, but but it's it's one of those things it, it led you to where you are and i mean yeah it, it's it's one of those things for for a guy that's not in the army and for people watching that aren't in the army to to see like oh like wait you got you got a dental dental assistant but you did all this cool stuff yeah. some people some people think it's exaggerated but again if you put if you're pfc kelly and you're pulling perfect pt scores and you're a winning soldier of the year. I mean, truly, your doors your doors really seem to be open. Yeah. All yeah. Right. So, 
so so we've covered all that uh when did you decide like uh being being a warrant officer going to pilot school when when did you decide all that when, do, when was that really the this is what i want to do moment the, the this is what i want to do moment was actually once again back at fort hood um i had just gotten back from sfas and i was really down in the dumps and i for sure after beating myself up for three weeks destroying my body it was the hardest thing that i had done at the time um with seer school actually I mean, my new <laughs> worst thing this past December, but at the time, man, that was, I was a wreck just emotionally, physically, mentally, I was drained and I, I, I still didn't want to be dental and the SF told me they didn't want me. So I was still clawing at ways to, you know, I kept going to the boards and stuff. It, it gave me something to do. It relieved me. I didn't have to go do so much of the dental stuff, but, um, that moment really came while I was right after SFAS. I was like, you know what? What's something else? Like maybe I maybe I'll commission. Maybe I'll become an officer. This enlisted life kind of is not for me. I I I think it's no coincidence that my my dad and my mom's dad both stayed in as long as they could, and they were both colonels. And then both my brothers who were enlisted got out at the end of one contract. They were just one and done. Absolutely not. And I was the late one to the party. I was the late bloomer. I was a, I was a private when my younger brother was a sergeant in the Marines. So I just watched all of this happen to all of these careers. I was like, dang, if I'm going to stay in and do this, I think I might need to become an officer. Otherwise, I don't think I'm going to make it. I, I hate this crap. So, um, yeah, I was like, well, I guess I could either do the green to gold program, which would make me a second lieutenant. I considered becoming a nurse at that time, like my mom, like my brother is about to become on the outside. Um, and then I really started thinking, I don't like medical. I don't, I'm not happy in dental. I don't think I'll be happy as a nurse either. So the other part of that, of course, emulate, emulate, emulate. My, my dad has an aviation background. Uh, there's aviation background in my mom's family. Maybe I'll try to become a pilot. The army doesn't, the army does have fixed wing. Um, but it seems kind of boring. There's, there's not really a lot of exciting stuff about flying a plane to me. You, you take right. it and then you're, you're, you're done and then you land. And those are the two most exciting parts. But I mean, flying an Apache attack helicopter, you're like shooting hellfire missiles while you're inverted flying at 120 knots, you know, it's, it's different. So, right. right. Very, well, I mean, I, th I think that's, there's, there's something to be said for that because people, you know, some people are looking for something different. Some people are, you know, I know I don't want to speak ill of any of the officers in, in the Air Force, but realistically, you, you see guys that come through and they may either they're they're looking to do 20 and get out so they can hit that retirement. But a lot of them are looking at, hey, I want to fly this big, heavy, boring bird. So when I get out, I can fly a big, heavy, boring bird. I mean, sometimes, sometimes it's, you know, sometimes it's for passengers, sometimes it's for cargo, but a lot of times you do see that. So, I yeah. mean, I, I see that nothing wrong with being like, you know what, like, Hey, being a pilot's cool, but you know, what's really cool being a pilot and blowing stuff up. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. So yeah, uh, for obvious reasons, it piqued my interest and it, it also helps that it was the only feeder MOS. My, my MOS could only feed into that. Like you can't be a dental assistant and then go on to become like uh, a, a tech warrant that works and builds, you know, security systems and, you know, computer software. Cause those exist. Right. Uh, those are walking warrants. We are flying warrants. We're aviation warrants. Um, you can take anyone and teach them how to be a pilot, but that doesn't mean that it's not hard and challenging. Trust me. Um, but yeah, so I digress. The The moment really came in 2016 after I attended SFAS and was told no. And I started working on it from there. And I worked on this packet because it, it is a packet. And really, they say that the first test of a warrant officer is the warrant officer walks packet because right. I worked on it for three years, <laughs> three years on and off. Like, I, I never truly on it i did it in like the background of things but i couldn't just you know that wasn't my job i still had i had been transferred to the hospital um in my field i became very proficient in omfs which is actually oral maxillofacial surgery so i've helped to extract over 4,000 wisdom teeth at this point um i've helped sew not sew up 
like gashes in the head, anything basically above the clavicle, uh, dental and oral surgery can take care of it in regards to what I know from the, uh, the medical or the army standpoint of dental. I'm, I'm going to be honest that that all sounds absolutely disgusting. I am <laughs> so very interested in the medical career field, but when you start talking about taking out wisdom teeth, I'm just, you, you lose me. You lose me. I'm just, I'm not, I'm not here for that. It, it was honestly the most fun. It, it almost got me to stay in the field. It really did. I, and, and you know what? I could see how, it just it's it's one of those things man i'm just hey what do you do uh on a good day i take teeth out of people's heads like ah, i mean i guess yeah it, i don't again i'm not trying to slam any military career fields out there i'm just saying at a certain point you lose me and sticking your hands in people's mouths even if it's taking out teeth and saving their life i don't i don't know i again again i'm i'm in one of the more you know boring curry fields in the air force and you know i love every second of it but uh yeah i could also see the drawbacks to it but again teeth out of people's face i'm i'm not here for it it's definitely something to get used to but i mean just there's so right. much that goes into oral surgery conscious sedation um patient rapport i was putting in i learned how to put in ivs better than any freaking medic you'll ever find and meet um i i it was awesome. I'm going to be on. I will. I'll give them credit. Uh, the average dental assistant, maybe not one. Like you've been saying, don't want to speak ill of anyone. If you enjoy it, because I know people that really enjoy it. There's some leaders in that field that are just so passionate about it. And it's actually really impressive. Um, it's just a different type of person, you know, but man, when you come across, if you come across a dental assistant who has a, a an extensive background in oral surgery, oh, it was it was a lot of fun. I had a lot of fun. I bitched about it at the time, but in retrospect, I learned so much and stuff, and it, it really almost got me to stay in the field. But um, I had to continue working and stuff like that. I were I kept going to boards. I eventually won NCO of the year uh, once I uh, got promoted and stuff. And all the all the time, the whole time, I'm just working on this warrant packet in the background. Like it was even in my bio uh, during every single board. You know sitting at attention in my blues, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, or president and members of the board, my name is blah, 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 and just this whole spiel. And then again, it was like my long-term goal is to become a 153 Alpha Rotary Wing in the Army. And some some of them didn't like that. Some of them were really impressed by it. And I eventually ran, once I won NCO of the year, I ran across a Sergeant Major in the soft community who was all about helping me. And after I won NCO of the year, I... I was approached on brag by a master sergeant and he was the prior acting first sergeant of third special forces group up there. He shook my hand, congratulated me and told me to come see him in his office in this building. So I went up, uh, I eventually came and saw him and he sat me in the corner of his office, didn't say anything. He just said, Oh yes, Sergeant Kelly, please have a seat. And I sat there for like 20 minutes, didn't say a single word to me. It was honestly a little weird, let's, but let's, let's be honest. You were slightly terrified. <laughs> a little bit. I you were you. Slightly ter I, there's, there's no, but I, I know some people get to the point where they don't care, but while you still kind of care about your career, yeah. if you get sat in the corner of any <laughs> high ranking person's office to a point, if they come to say hi to you, maybe not so much. They sit you in their office. They sit you in the corner and they don't speak to you for a little bit you're just yeah. like so i know i didn't do anything wrong but let me run down the list of things in my entire life <laughs> that this man or woman found out that i did wrong i guarantee that's exact that's what goes that's what's went through my head so i just imagine <laughs> that's what goes through everybody's head is when they get sat down for you know again sometimes it's five minutes sometimes it's ten yeah. But you will compile a list in your head yeah. of all the terrible, wooden, <laughs> slightly wrong things you did in your life. And you're like, why did I do that? He's going to, I'm in so much trouble for this. And you're just like, but I know I didn't do anything wrong in the army. Yeah. I'm like, oh, they found out about that ticket that I got off post. <laughs> I didn't want to tell anyone about it. <laughs> didn't think anybody find out. It's not that important. It's like, oh, yeah. here it is. Five years later, I'm, I'm getting hit for it. Well, that's really how it happens, though. But yeah. <laughs> so 
I mean, he also sat me behind the door and people kept coming in too. So they kept opening the door like on my legs and I'm just, it was super awkward and super weird. And he didn't say you it. Knew it was, you know, it's on purpose, right? You know, he did that on purpose. He wanted you to get hit with the door. He wanted you to fear, fear him a little bit. Yeah. I'm just, I'm just saying like, I've, I haven't had any, the army is a different breed for, again, I'm in the air force. I did a, a nice joint project with some pleasant Puerto Rican National Guard Army folks while I was in Iraq. And uh, somebody, I don't know who, to this day, we never got anybody to admit to, to who did it. And I'm almost convinced the Sergeant Major did it, just because that's how Sergeant Majors are. But somebody microwaved a banana in the Sergeant Major's <laughs> And that banana caught fire. Yeah. While we were doing this housing project. <laughs> That's great. And that Sergeant Major, he did not care if you were Air Force, Army, Marines. You were on your face. Yeah. You were on your face. And I was like, I don't know. what He's like, just every, all the Army has, hey, bro, just, it'll be easier if you get on your face. And I'm like, okay. And as I'm getting down to the lean rest position, I'm just thinking, you know what? Like we have some actual problems to deal with here, and this sergeant makes up again. I'm convinced to this day because nobody admitted it. Nobody, and we. I don't. I. It's it's real hard to not dog on the army a little bit, but I had two of those gentlemen legitimately swinging hammers at each other. Really, as a game, <laughs> as a game. To where I'm like, it had to have been one of them. It had to have been. But but nobody admitted to it. To where I'm like, did the sergeant major just light his own room on fire in Iraq to put us on our face? Because they need to feel something. Possible. I guess. I'm just I'm just saying there there are times where the arm I've heard either I've heard or experienced. Yeah. Uh gentlemen of the higher rank in the army. Just doing all kinds of things. Be like, I want you to know who your military daddy is. And the sergeant major is your military daddy. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I, I've run into more toxic E6s than I have E9s. But hey, I and you know what? That's that's a, that's a part of, unfortunately, uh, the, you know, we, we run into some of that. So I don't want to get off too much on a tangent <laughs> because you want the story to be about you. Uh, sure. But but yeah. There, there are some toxic leaders out there, which is, which is why I encourage people. Either you, you do one of two things: you stay in to make to be a better leader, yeah, or you get out because staying in and not wanting to be the better leader and just sitting there and taking it, it's it's unpleasant for every for you, for your partners, for leadership. It's it's unpleasant for everybody. You're yeah. not going to be happy, which which is why I'm glad to hear that you, that you stayed. I. I I would probably assume that your brothers got out. You're just like, hey, um, this is not for me. And, yeah. at, and at certain points, I've seen I've seen it happen. Again, 14 years. I'm, I'm fairly committed to just finishing out 20 years. But 14 years, you see a lot of people who just, again, they get to the point where it's time to be done. And earlier in my career, I said, I don't, I mean, you're so, you know, you're, you're, you only have this many years left. But when it's your time, it's your time. That's what, that's what I'll tell everybody. Yeah. 32 year old me will say, Hey, look, when it's your time, it's your time. It, and it's, you know, again, glad to hear that. Glad to hear that you decided <laughs> to stick around. I mean, it's, it's one of those things. I mean, even, even if it is just in your career field, it's, it's one of those things where people can see, Hey, no, no, no. I didn't join. I didn't join as infantry. I didn't join as one of those stereotypical, uh, stereotypical people that you would think end up as warrant officers. Because to be honest, at this point, when I went to Afghanistan, was the first time I, I encountered a warrant officer in the wild, is what I called it. Yeah. At that point, I was a civilian deploying to Afghanistan. Still one of the dumber but enlightening choices in my life to voluntarily deploy as a civilian. But I got to see warrant officers in the wild. Yeah. And I, I thought, this is the coolest job. <laughs> and they were, they were also helicopter pilots. 
Yeah. But they just seem to have the coolest job and nobody hassled them. Meanwhile, civilian me with my dirty beard was worried about making somebody mad because it's like, hey, I could get fired from this. This isn't the military where I get yelled at. I get fired from this job. Yeah. <laughs> but again, to see somebody say, hey, you know what? Like, I started out because I thought I'd like this job. Um, did everything in their power to, to paint themselves in a good light because I feel like not enough people do that. And I feel like the people that do that don't get recognized for it kind of throw their hands up. So, I mean, to a point, I mean, you're not in that, you're not in that group that didn't get recognized. You're in the group that did get recognized, but you're taking advantage of those, those opportunities and saying, Hey, look, I put myself in this position. I want to be a, a pilot, which I think, I think is great. I think it's really cool. I'm probably going to try to, you know, get some paperwork done, call it a training exercise to where you have to give me a ride in that helicopter. <laughs> you know, I'm down, man. I'm <sighs> but you know, I mean, that's, that's the thing. So how, how, how much, uh, how much longer you got flight school? Oh shit. <laughs> I'm not supposed to believe here until February or March next year. I've got like a year left. Okay. And okay. Okay. I've been here for a year. Um, yeah, it's a lot. It's a lot. And God, um, it's, it's honestly kind of hard to put into words. Um, I came, the, so the first step in the entire process is to actually get your rank, right? You got to earn the rank. You got to go to walks, warrant officer candidate school. And yep. uh, you, you have to get recommended to go and, I mean, that actually brings it back to the packet really fast to, to just finish that, that story up so that the master sergeant sits me down, doesn't say anything for 20 minutes. He's just typing. People are coming in and out and I'm just sitting there getting my legs banged like for 20, 15, 20 minutes. It's the super weird. And then he had been typing these emails, live emailing the guy he knew. And he was like, okay. And then like real covert, he gives me like this. He's like, you need to go to this building and you need to go up to this floor in this room. And you're going to ask for CW5. Greenwood. So um, I found out that the address he gave me was actually to our SOAC on Bragg, which is uh, Army Special Operate Army Aviation Special Operations. I, I appreciate you. Yeah, I, there's even some acronyms in the military. I don't know, so I appreciate you letting us all know. I mean, the- I didn't. I'd been in for five years, something like that at that point. I didn't even freaking know. So um, he's basically the chief. He's like the top dog. So there's only like five ranks of warrant officers. There's W01, and then you become a chief. You become chief warrant officer two, chief warrant officer three, or CW2, CW3, CW4, and then the illustrious CW5. And there's only like, there's less than 100 of them across the entire army. They all know each other. They've all been in for like 30 years, and they're all like the top dog in all of their fields. So. Uh, you have to get a recommendation from a CW3 or higher for your warrant officer packet to go to walks. So this guy sent me to the third highest chief in the entire army, it turns out. I didn't know who this guy was. Uh, why would I? Right. But everyone in aviation knew who he was. It turns out my sar- my command, my battalion command sergeant major, who also had to sign off on my packet at the end, he was like, Greenwood, this is your guy? I know this guy. We we were at we were at Campbell together or something. You realize that he recommended you? You realize this man is a god. And I was like, dang, he called him a god. Oh, his grown man calls another grown man a god. <laughs> I was like, God. Hey, I mean, it it's one of one of those things you rarely see, but it's always appreciated. You see somebody like just in in a career field be deeply admired by somebody. Oh yeah. Greenwood, Greenwood lower ranking the CW five, correct? What? Greenwood? You said he's lower ranking than the CW5 you met, correct? No, no, no. Greenwood is the CW5. Okay, who was... Sorry, I I lost track somewhere. Who was I, the person who recommended you? CW5 Greenwood. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> well, hot damn. Hot damn, yeah. <laughs> I Yeah, sorry. Let's bring that together. He ended up... I had like three different interviews with him. I kept having to leave and come back, leave and come back. Still had to do my 
special operations dental thing over here. I was jumping every now and then doing airborne ops. And um, in between, I would go and see CW5 Greenwood over at uh, Army Special Operations Aviation Headquarters. And one day he emailed me, like, he called me Ben. It was, was super weird. He emailed me and said, hey, Ben, um, here's your recommendation for your warrant officer packet. I hope you have a good time. Yada, yada, yada. I was like, holy crap, that's cool. So I put on, uh, that was it. That was the, that was done after three years. That was my whole packet put together. So I took it to the warrant officer recruiter. I said, here you go. He, once again, another grown man flipping through saying, William Greenwood, are you kidding me? That's the guy that recommended you? You know who he is? And I was like, I mean, no, but. Apparently a real nice guy if he's recommending you for, for warrant officer. officer. Yeah. Oh, that's. Yeah, for real. Um, he really, he and I got off, like, I was supposed to meet with him for like 10 minutes and it always, it was only ever supposed to be a 10, 15 minute thing. It's always supposed to be super busy. I'd always end up sitting down with him for like an hour and a half and we had a lot in common, it turns out. So anyway, whole packet gets put together. Boom. Accepted to walks. Like the uh, first, first look and everything, like it just worked out. Um, so now back on track. You go to Ward Officer Canada, uh, Candidate School. You got a PCS down here to Fort Rucker, Alabama. Um, I think I was in it. I was in walks for like eight weeks. It's basically like going back to basic training, but even more stupid. Because now you're like an E5, an E6, an E7. There were some E8s, some first sergeants who were there going through to become warrant officers. And you're all thrown in and you your rank becomes walk. You're a warrant officer candidate. And everyone's the same all of a sudden. And it's really, really dumb, <laughs> but it's kind of like a rite of passage. There's a lot of tradition behind it. It's like army dumb. You know what I mean? We're all singing cadence and walking in formation and all that stuff. It's terrible. So it's about, it's, well, it's I mean, Hey, it's, 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 I will say this being somebody who transitioned from one career field to another in the military, uh, any kind of marching outside of basic training seems dumb. I still have people do it. Uh, I still, you know, there's still times that I've been made to march, but at the same time, I, I, yeah, I, I completely understand being like, oh yeah, well you gotta march. It's like, I'm, I'm gonna be a warrant officer, right? Like you're not, you're not taking rank away. What did I do here? So <laughs> I, I definitely feel that. They're, de they're definitely trying to knock people out. So it's, it's every every school you go to, like SFAS had it too. There's like a gate week or like a they just try to knock out the weaklings really fast. You know, the mentally weak right. week. There's like a long run that you gotta go on with like a rifle and stuff like that. And a lot of people aren't up to it. Um and they get eliminated or recycled or something along those lines. But anyway, you you go through walks, you make it through. Uh and after that you gotta go to something called Wobic, which is a warrant officer basic course. For us, because of COVID, it was all online. Uh, it was like three or four weeks long, just doing, taking tests online and stuff. Very college-like. After walks, it becomes very college-like. Um, distance learning, or sometimes you might have to go into a classroom. And then uh, after that, it becomes very not uh, college-like. Uh, after that is Sears School. Mm -hmm. And I know <laughs> it, again... I know there are certain things that, that go into it. Are you able to to let us know any anything, or is, is that stuff that we really can't share? I know, again, we both have security clearances, uh, however, comma, not everyone watching does. So I know there's a limited amount we can share. Yeah. Um, but yeah. in generalities, can you kind of share what you went through during SEER? In generalities, yes. Uh, put really blunt like blunt uh sears like three weeks long and uh three or four weeks and it's made up of three phases the third one is the most severe and it's the one that makes everybody cry and it destroys people and breaks them off and stuff like that that's the part right. that you're not really supposed to talk about um uh you can google a lot of that stuff honestly yeah. out uh if you just google like your school experiences who knows what you'll find? Um, maybe some accurate stuff, maybe not. But it's definitely the part that everybody talks about. 
or is not supposed to talk about, but still talks about. But, <laughs> um, but everything leading up to that, I mean, it was really cool. Like you, um, you learn a lot of really cool skills. I know a lot of really interesting stuff now um, when it comes to uh, evasion and escape and survival techniques. It's really cool. Um, it, you know, SEER stands for survival, evasion, resistance, and escape. It's very imperative for pilots uh, of any kind to have this information and to have this schooling. You fly over enemy lines, whether they know you're there or not sometimes. And, you know, yeah. at, that's at least that's what the movies tell me. Um, <laughs> so, right. yeah, if, if you get, like, shot, over, shot down over enemy lines or something like that, you will find yourself in combat. And they just teach you how to handle the situation, whatever situation you're in. Um, but as as for the definitely what cannot be talked about is the resistance. That's actually the super secretive protective part that you're not really tell anybody. Right. So so I I do have I do have one question on it. Sure. Have you seen a woman get punched in the face? Have I seen a woman get punched in the face? I cannot confirm or deny that I've seen a woman. Okay. Get okay. Punched. Okay. Yeah, wasn't sh wasn't sure what I was allowed to ask. Um, uh, I did find out in Sears school though that uh, what I I laugh when I'm nervous. I laugh in like uncomfortable. If you ask me an awkward question or an uncomfortable question, something I'm like either don't like or something that makes me remember something, I'll laugh. And damn, does that not work in Sears school? I had a. Oh, de definitely. I mean, laughing in the military in general is just frowned upon. You appear happy. I'm not saying the military doesn't want you happy. You just can't appear happy. Do not appear happy because they're gonna want. They're gonna ask what what is what's what's so funny. What's what's making you happy? Tell us. We all want to know. We all want. We all want to know why you're happy and how we can get there. Uh, Let's find right. out, uh, PT. But anyway, so Sear School was. Fun. You saw me after Sears. That's, that's I, I, I did. I did. I did. Um, it was. It was. It, and honestly, um, I don't want to dig too much into that because I, I do feel it was one of those those nice personal shared moments. But I, I will say it gave me from from the guy I knew who I first met. Uh, I'm fairly certain the first time we met was you did a crawfish boil for us, and when I met you, you had no shirt on. <laughs> and so my idea from that guy, because I was, I was basically, you know, I was told like, Hey, you know, he, he's a little too much like you. And I was like, Oh, so I was like, so we're going to like each other, or hate each other. Like, yep. Yes. But everybody kept so saying seeing, seeing that part of you to seeing, uh, seeing that side of you, I did at post seer school. Um, I, I, I definitely appreciated it because it was one of those, those, those moments where one of those human moments, and I feel like that's something that we don't, whether it's friends, family, coworkers, stuff like that, we don't we don't appreciate that enough. Um, so I just, you know, again, for you, for people watching, uh, I, I deeply appreciate that moment because it did give me a different side of you, which I mean, I you know, I it sounds corny, but I, I do wish I could keep that moment, which is why, I, you know, I don't really want to share it, what, you know, what all that entailed. Yeah. I got you. <laughs> well, yeah, no, it's it, again. Your yours is a is a cool story. Uh, one of those things where, I, again, I don't want to sound corny or anything like that. But but you go from a kid who who didn't have a, a super solid upbringing. In what does is common. You don't have a super solid upbringing. What do you do when you're 18, 20, 22, whatever? Uh, you join the military. Yeah, I, I need to find a place in my life to join the military. Uh, but but you kept you kept pushing for you know, I it sounds funny but greatness like you you want whether or not it's for you or for other people you you want to be great, and even if it's just I want to be a great pilot, you want to be a great man you want to be a great father for those that don't know you know Ben's got a kid, um, he, you know, fantastic dad. Tell her I miss her. <laughs> Will do. She'll be but, glad. But but it's one of those things that you you come across people and and that that was a lot of what I wanted to do with this podcast. Yeah, is, is I wanted whether whether it's just for you and me, 
whether the people watching see something. I I want people to really see, hey, like the people you know or kind of know, they have really good stories. Yeah. I mean, I learned something about you today. And I love you, brother. But like, that's the thing is I learned stuff about you today. I think yeah. it's great. Yeah. I trust me, I, I am not so obtuse as to think that this isn't um, kind of crazy. I, I have these like moments of clarity when flight school kind of the stresses and the mental strain of flight school kind of melts away. And I do. I mean, I'll, I'll talk with Lindsay, my wife. Um, I'll talk with her on and off and just. I, I, I don't know. I just I'll think like, man from from the way that where i was where i was even even just seven eight years ago to where i am now i mean i at one point in my life i was straight up homeless i was taking the bus everywhere um i i had no prospects i barely had family and today it's crazy um the, the I, I I reserve the right to talk a lot of shit about the army, but I'm a lifer. The army has given me so much, so many awesome experiences. I've been paid to rappel backwards out of Black Hawk helicopters a hundred feet above the ground. I've been paid to uh, pull out wisdom teeth. Who the like even that in itself is like what the heck? That doesn't make any sense. I've done <laughs> deep surgery on people's jaw bones have cut open their mouths and scraped their jaws with instruments and pulled out teeth that are embedded in them it's insane i've been paid to jump out of planes going 150 knots a quarter mile in the sky and use an air a parachute to float to the ground and then get up and continue mission like it it's insane and now and now they they pay me to fly a helicopter. I mean, God, I never saw that. In my life. You told me ten years ago that this is where I would be. I would have laughed in your face. Like one, why would I join the military? And two, a helicopter pilot doesn't make any freaking sense. I I don't even want to do that. And then it just kind of became this thing for the years. And to see where I am now, I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't know. Not not to like, not to gush on myself, I guess. But I mean, even. Just, me and Lindsay as a team, like we're, we're homeowners. You know, we bought, we bought our first home um, about a month ago. Uh, we were a two car family. My daughter goes to a great school. Like I have a good, fun, pay, decently paying job that I'm completely satisfied with. And you can only still go, you go, you continue up from here. This isn't the end. We, this isn't a plateau. This is actually the first spike in a long time in just the, a standard of living. And God, I I'll I'll look you dead in your face and tell you I hate the army. The army's stupid. Uh, F the army. I, I don't want to be here. I can't wait to get out. And I, I would I said that for years and I say it today, but it's all it's all just a giant it's all just a giant facade. I'm a I'm a lifer, dude. I'm gonna do to I'm gonna do my twenty years at a minimum. One day maybe I'll be CW five Kelly, you know, Apache pilot who's like blown up freaking tank in north korea in world war three you know I mean, hey i mean and, and maybe you'll get that moment where somebody writes you know asks you for a recommendation and oh, they you know the next person sees it the warrant officer recruiter sees it and says cw5 kelly that dude is a god <laughs> exactly i mean i again yeah. i don't want to i don't want to blow you up but i mean that's that's the reason for pushing for it and and one of those things is I as I want I want other people to see that hey you you push for stuff you can get it it's yeah. attainable and you're already on your journey there I think that's I think it's great man thanks yeah you can you can you can do anything you can be anything it's I mean not not to really put up I mean because in the end I I am just a, a helicopter trainee in the in the army right now. but right. it really is leaps and bounds above where i thought i would ever be and what i thought i would ever be warrant officer one kelly was everything that i thought i would ever be um, and now 
after just a couple of years, I, I was in the dental field for five years and doing what I could, trying to be the fake cool guy. Cause you can only, you can only, you can be a paratrooper, but you can, you can only a special operations paratrooper, but you can only be as cool. I mean, you, you can't be that cool. Like as the dent, you're still just the dental guy, you know, and you can, you can do anything. You can be anything. I, I, it sounds super cliche, but damn, man, it's, it's very surreal. I've, 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 right now I'm flying Lakotas, uh, UH-72 Lakotas. It's the train helicopter for the army, dual engine, little four, four rotor system, uh, super fun flying at 8,000 feet, cruising to Destin, fly out and, you know, into the Gulf a little bit, turn and approaches into uh, Eglin Air Force Base, and it's it's super cool. I start BWS, uh, Basic Warrior Skills. I'll start that in next week, actually. That's where they teach you how to, like, do all the tactical flying and stuff. It's still flight school. It's still, like, common flight, but that's where you start doing, like, the cool guy stuff that I wanted to do. They start teaching you how to do that in the trainer helicopter. And then this summer, uh, by the time we see you guys, the next time we see you guys this summer, I will have selected my aircraft. Um, and that's the the final thing really on flight school that I can really talk about and know completely what I'm talking about. Um, not speculation from, you know, previous classes that have told me a little thing here or there is there, there are four airframes to choose in the army. So uh, you have the option of the AH-64, which is the Apache helicopter. A lot of people actually just know that one. Uh, everyone knows the famous Black Hawk, the UH-60. That's another one that is an option. There is the dual, the big, the big girl, uh, the Chinook. Uh, that it, it's just this giant bus of a of a helicopter, but it it's fat, but it's the fastest one somehow, apparently. And then there's the option of getting C-12, which is a uh, fixed wing option, dual prop fixed wing. So honestly, like I've said before, like I said earlier in this, the fixed wing sounds kind of boring to me personally. I don't know if I really like the mission that comes along with the Chinook, so I don't think I'm going to pick that either. So it's really up to the Black Hawk or the Apache. At this point, um, I'm just... I've been doing this for a couple of months now. I'm very much done with flight school. I, I've reached a point where I'm like, give me either. I don't care. I'll fly anything you tell me to. But they each have their pros. Um, right. A, the Apaches, the Apache, the torpedoes and Hellfire missiles and the chain gun that you're you're hovering 300 feet in the air and like sitting behind trees and you come out and fire and shoot it, blow stuff up and then hide back in the trees again. And then there's the black hole, which can be anything that you want it to be. I've, I've heard it referred to as the Honda Civic of Army helicopters. <laughs> <laughs> you can make it whatever you need it to be. It can become whatever a Whatever you want it to be. Yeah. So, yeah, uh, that's that's all the stuff that's really up in the air for me right now is, you know, just pushing through, trying to do what I can to make it to the end. And, yeah, that'll be the next thing on the list after basic warrior skills coming up here is – um, I'll find out and I'll let you know if I end up as an pilot or a Blackhawk pilot. Awesome. Hey, well, for, for me, uh, keep it a surprise. I, you know, again, we'll, we'll see each other Father's Day weekend. So uh, keep it a surprise for me till then. Will do. I can do that. All right. Uh, do you have anything you want to promote? Anything you want to plug before we go today? Yes, sure. Uh, really fast. Once again, you can be anything that you want to be. You can think that it's not possible, but you can go the distance. You can do anything that you set your mind to. Perseverance is huge. And even if you're not in the army, you can be in any branch. I know a couple of Air Force people and I know a couple of Marines and Navy, actually. I know every single branch. Coast Guard. I know a Coastie who was did an in uh, a, a service branch transfer to become a W01 in the army. Like this is the best rank in the world. And this has got to be the coolest thing that I've done in my life. You can do it. Drop the packet. It's the first test. It takes a lot of tenacity, but you, you, 
you're capable. I promise. Do your best, and they will. They pick up the best. Do your best, and you'll get picked. It's that simple. Um, Ward Officer One Kelly signing off. I guess. <laughs> hey, I'll I'll co I'll co-sign that. Um, I'll co I'll co-sign. It's, I don't really need to add to what Ben said. Um, I think it's awesome what he's doing. Um, for everybody watching, I appreciate you staying on this long. Uh, again, uh, if you got any questions, you want any ideas, we have the email scrolling across the bottom. It's Kyle the weight at gmail.com. Uh, also, we don't have any content up yet, but Instagram, WR Podcast Official on Instagram. Uh, I also want to shout out again, and I'll continue to shout out these two men, Taj, uh, Taj TV. You can find him on Facebook as well. Um, again, guy who's pushed me to do this. Uh, second guy I want to highlight, Marcus. Brother, uh, Truth Valley Church on Facebook. If you find him, again, you may not be super religious, but the man's doing great work through God. I'm not saying I'm the greatest Christian, uh, but I'm saying that this man has a message and he wants to be heard, so I'm going to keep supporting him. So Truth Valley Church on Facebook. Again, everybody watching, I appreciate it. Like the page, share it with your friends. Uh, again, it's a way to kill time. Waiting room podcast. Appreciate it, guys.